session, and um, I want to tell you a little bit of the introduction, a little of what I think about attention in general, how I'm going to define attention for this particular talk. I know that among philosophers, as John said, uh, the interest in, is in how. Am I in this You're fine. Okay. The interest is in how attention affects appearance or our perceived world. But to me, that question is only relevant in the context of other things that attention does. So first, I'm going to tell you how attention actually affects performance. I, I think of attention doing two things, right? It, alters, it affects performance and it alters the way that we see. And so I think it's better to think about these issues in a general framework. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some performance studies where some of them may be familiar to some of you. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about the experiments that just recently I found again, to a large degree, um, thanks to Ned Block, have become popular in philosophy. I don't know if I would call it rock star, but I found some dissertations lately, and unfortunately I found them two nights ago. So I would lie if I say that I've read them. Uh, but I'm very interested in hearing what you think about those things. What I want to tell you, of course, I'm not going to pretend to be a philosopher, because I'm not. I want to tell you what I do, why I do it, and then I'll be very happy to have a dialogue about whether we have a common or a different interpretation and how we can hopefully enrich each other's interpretation. So the first thing that is very important for me when I think about attention is that um, even though I think we all know this, um, I always get amazed with, or it always keeps surprising me, the fact that we seem to have a coherent idea of what's happening out there of the world, out there in the world, right? However, we're really confronted with an enormous amount of information. Simultaneously, and we know that we cannot cope with all that information at the same time. So the first thing that I think when I think attention is it is a selective process. And uh, much like uh, Borges in Funes the Memories talk about how forgetting is what enables remembering and thinking, many times I think that in attention, actually what we ignore is what it allows us to perceive. So I think that attention has a functional role, a very important functional role, and I think that attention often turns looking into seeing. So for this talk, first I'm going to talk about some definitions, and I'm going to do that because I think it's very important to talk about what we mean by attention, how we operationalize it when we talk about experimental studies. Then I'm going to tell you, as I said, about some effects on performance, um, no, for, for the effects of attention on contrast sensitivity, and then I'm going to talk about appearance, um, particularly about how it affects perceived contrast, because that's where I can relate really better to studies of performance. But as some of you know, we have shown that attention affects appearance in several dimensions. And of course, I'm going to rule out alternative explanations for the effect that I want to present. So surprisingly, even though we're in a talk for philosophy is very important, um, this is the first time we see James. And I think this assertion of Dave, with which a lot of talks start, actually um, has been very beneficial and, and has done a lot of damage to the field at the same time. And the reason why it's been that, it's also, is because it says that everyone knows what attention is. So I think we all have an idea of what attention may be, but that has also allowed us to use the word attention as a, what we are we call, uh, call a false contract. contract. Wherever we put those things, we don't understand them, we call them attention. So I think the first part is not very, very important, very useful for me. The second part, I think, is something that we've all thought about. It's the taking possession by the mind, in general, with its form, of one of what seems about simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. Focalization, concentration, and consciousness are of its essence. It implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. And I think the last sentence is really important because one of the things that we found, and we're going to talk about those, is that as you attend to certain location space, you know, that happens in the future world too, but today I'm going to talk about spatial attention, it actually has several repercussions at the other locations, right? And I think we have to constantly think about these trade-offs that attention brings about. Um, I'm a experimentalist, and um, so I love hands-on, and I love this example of Helmholtz, which to my mind is the first example that I've seen, the, the first experimental example that I've seen on covert attention. So, um, this is a second and maybe last quote. Um, Helmholtz said, it's a curious 
Falcon Observer may be gazing steadily at the two pink holes that form in an exact coincidence, and yet at the same time he can concentrate his attention on any part of the dark field he likes, so that when the spark comes, he will get an impression about objects in that particular region around it. In this experiment, the attention is entirely independent of the position and accommodation of the eyes, or indeed of any known variations in or on the organ of vision. Thus, it is possible simply by a conscious and voluntary effort to focus attention on some definite spot in an absolutely dark and featureless field. So, as you can see here, he, there was this wooden box, there's a pinhole, he has different things on the display. Oh, they look at it, sorry. And there's the sparks of light, and when they get on, he decides where he's going to attend to, and that's actually what he claims he's conscious of. So I, I like a lot this idea because I think that many things about attention may be intuitive, but many things may not. So um, when we talk about attention, I think there's um, something that we all agree on, which is that it facilitates and selects information. But one thing that is important to keep in mind is attention is not necessarily a unitary process, right? But what I think is common to different processes that were referred to as attention is that it prioritizes processing for some information over other. And it can do different in different ways. For example, with overt attention where eye movements or attention accompanies eye movements, and we've heard many examples of that today and yesterday. But today I'm going to talk about covert oops, covert attention, which as you know is the um, skill that we have to deploy attention to a given location in space without shifting our gaze. And as you know, there's many thousand studies showing that humans and different animals are capable of doing this. Now, one of the things that in cognitive psychology is, um, is an old concept, I think it came back in the 60s, is that we have capacity limited resources. And um, even though this idea has been in cognitive psychology since the 60s, it's only been evaluated relatively recently, and um, this is a biophysical paper actually by Peter Lenny published in 2003, where he explains very clearly that the high energy cost of neural activity involves in cortical computation linked to our ability to process information. And he does a really interesting calculation for which we have to just follow uh, the principle, the following principle. One is that the cost of a single spike is high, and it severely limits the number of neurons that can be substantially active concurrently. And the, the calculations are such that the calculation is quite striking. According to this analysis, it's only about 1% of the neurons that can be active substantially concurrently above baseline. Yeah. I thought we only used 10% of them. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe around three clay. Okay. <laughs> so given these severe computations, uh, that's my friend and colleague. If you talk, I may say you shut up. No, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> and a few others. Um, but the interesting thing about this limitation, actually, is that then we need to have some sort of machinery in the brain that helps us allocate energy according to that demand. And it's been proposed that selective attention may be one such mechanism. May, there may be others, for example, adaptation. But selective attention may help a key, a key role in trying, of, in trying to help us to allocate energy according to task demands. So, um, other things that are ideas that are consistent with this one is uh, that we can think about neurons with limited capacity channels or sets of neurons. When we think about a neuron, we um, earlier today someone mentioned that how receptive field size increases as visual information transverses the successive, the successive cortical areas of the ventral visual stream, right? So that what happens is that in the, the neurons that are in higher order areas have many visual stimuli that are appearing simultaneously within the receptor fields. And as you know, there's several models, for example, um, bias competition, that propose that actually there is some competition within the receptor field, and there's several neurophysiological studies that support that view. Now, um, there's some work in my lab that deals with spatial attention, other that uh, deals with feature-based attention, as I said today. I'm going to concentrate on spatial covert attention, and I want to make very clear that there's two kinds of spatial 
conversion tension. Um, and I want to talk about examples of both of them. I think most of the time in this meeting when we've been using the term attention, we've been thinking about what is endogenous attention, which is voluntary. Um, it's, we, we, we can find it in the literature with different names, control versus reflexive, goal-driven versus stimulus-driven. Um, one important characteristic of endogenous attention is that it takes about 300 milliseconds to be deployed. And that is very simple, right? I'm looking at K and I just realized I was not going to see if David Figueroa was awake and I just realized he was there. But I didn't check his chair, right? Now, there's other instances that happen in the world. Mark, thank you, we timed it perfectly, that call my attention because things happen in the world, right? So, exogenous attention is actually driven by changes in the environment. And I think it helps us think about these two things in playing possibly complementary roles. If I only have endogenous attention, that would mean that I know in advance where the relevant information is going to be, which I think is a bit absurd, right? I think there has to be something in the environment that actually triggers to me where relevant information may be. And that is actually what triggers exogenous attention. So I think that those, they play complementary roles. And the person that always enters when I say that never knows what I said, but thanks, was perfect, 15 minutes. Um, in contrast, exogenous attention has this transient, it beats at about 100 milliseconds, and it dies shortly thereafter. And this is something that I would like you to keep in mind because uh, this is not quite working, I think. This is something that I would um, like you to keep. Oops, now I lost it. Okay. In mind because when I talk about some of the controls that we've done to actually show that attention is what, thank you so much. Is there a center? Uh, it's on. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm going to use this temporal dynamics. I'm going to take the temporal dynamics into account. We know that endogenous attention is mediated by cortical um, networks, and we know exogenous also has subcortical networks, and we know more about the feedback role of endogenous attention. Right? So we know there's uh, a lot of information happening that is being processed in front and parietal areas that is going to affect early cortical areas. Um, so now that I've talked about how I'm going to define attention, I'd like to tell you about some studies that we've done in the lab in which we have uh, characterized effects of attention on contrast sensitivity and the reason why we chose in that dimension um, is because some 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you read any textbook in introductory psychology or about introductory psychology or perception, you would see that the world was divided in pre-attentive and attentive processes. Some of them still do that, but less so now. And there were many things that by definition would be pre-attentive. For example, texture fragmentation would be pre-attentive. Contrast sensitivity, we not even thought of that attention could affect something as basic as contrast sensitivity, right? So now we talk about it and it seems normal, but I just want to tell you why 10 years ago or 12 years ago, whenever it was. We were interested in actually taking the idea that attention may affect the vision and taking it to the very early stages of processing. So, um, I'm actually going to go here because it would help me make the point. Um, can everybody see the two figures? This is a Salvador Dali painting, if you squint. People in the back only see the other one. That's People cool. on the back may see the face, Lincoln's face, which actually is here, if you want to prime yourself. People in the clothes may see the naked women. If you want to prime yourself, you can do that. If you're in the clothes, in the clothes, just squint. Can you see the face? Yes, okay. The reason why I use this is because this is a Salvador Dali's rendition, actually, of how information that is out there in the world can be processed at different scales. So those of you that are very close are using a lot of the high frequencies that are present in the painting and see the squares and have a lot of trouble seeing the face unless you really swing hard. Those of you that are far or to trim your glasses for that matter, all of a sudden, boom, Lincoln face is there, right? Okay. I'm going to come back to this idea, actually, and, and I know uh, there's a B word that will come out later. So I'm going to come back to this. So 
Here we have the stimulus is the same, we're seeing different spatial frequency content and we can see more one or the other figure, but I hope everybody has been able to do that. Now, this actually is taking advantage of the fact that we know that all visual stimuli can be decomposed into these basic um, spatial frequencies, orientations and phases. Some of you know that the reason why we use the word stimuli, which you've seen and you'll see more, is because we can decompose every visual stimulus with its basic characteristics, and maybe this is the slide that has been shown more in all perception classes in the world. This is a slide by um, Cameron and Robson in 1968, and here we plot contrast as a function of spatial frequency, and of course this is not very well calibrated, but I hope you can see that the contrast is higher at the bottom than in the top of the screen, that the lower frequencies are lower on the left and progress to the right. And the interesting thing is that depending on where you are sitting, how old you are, how good your eyes are, there's a moment in which you no longer can distinguish the sinusoidal fluctuations in light towards the top of the screen. So there's a moment around here where you no longer see the fluctuations, right? Now, the question that we had, again, about 12 years ago or so is, well, would it be possible that attention, and, and by the way, we refer to this contrast sensitivity function, is it here? More or less the limits may be there, depending on where you are. We refer to this contrast sensitivity function as a window of visibility. So the question that we had is, is it possible that attention could enhance contrast sensitivity? That is, could it change our window of visibility? And um, again, now this wouldn't be contested. There's many labs that have shown this. But back then, it was a provocative question because this, by definition, would have been part of the pre-attentive world. So I will show you just the results here. So the slide that I'm showing is based on the result. And if you were doing an orientation discrimination task, this is how much contrast you would need to be present for these different spatial frequencies in order to attain a given level of performance. And as you can see, where sensitivity drops at 8 cycles per degree, the right end of the graph that I showed you here, here, you're going to need higher contrast. You also need higher contrast at the low end, and you need less contrast where sensitivity is better. Okay? That's what always happens in vision. So the question here was, what is attention going to do? And I'll tell you a little bit about the paradigms that we use, but before I want to show you just some results. And this is how much less contrast you need in order to perform the task at the same accuracy level. So if I manipulate attention, and I'll tell you in a moment how we do that, you can see clearly that for each spatial frequency, you need less contrast in order to attain the same performance level. Okay? Now the next question is, if now I know that when I am looking at a given direction, or, or, or um, I don't know, I'm looking at Flores, right? And so I want to see if Ned is still awake, because he's taking a really comfortable position there. No, that's not Ned, I'm having an illusory. You, I'll keep an eye on you to make sure you're awake today. Okay, so I want to deploy my attention there. My contrast sensitivity is going to improve. Now the question is, what happens at other locations, right? So is my contrast sensitivity going to improve at a dependent location, or what the consequence is going to be at other locations? When we think about competition in attention, we usually think of very crowded displays. I've noticed that I've aged when, because when I tell my students something about Waldo, they look at me like, hmm? Huh? <laughs> but we used to think of Waldo displays. We used to think of busy displays, or go down to Broadway. We think of busy streets. And you say, whoa, this is why attention has to help us. But what the purpose, we have a very, very linear, so always I'm trying to go to the extreme, right? I'm making the most simplistic assumptions here. So I want to go to an incredibly poor, boring display, very simple display, and I'm actually just going to have two hours. So I'm not testing the system even that strongly here. And I'm going to see what attention is going to do. But for a second, I'm going to ask you to pretend that you're an observer in the task because I'm going to be using these for different examples. So you're looking at a fixation point, and after some time, a very brief cue is going to appear either in the center of the display or adjacent to one of the two targets. After a brief display, the target will be flashed for 100 milliseconds, let's say, and then a response cue will indicate which is the target that I want you to tell me the orientation of. 
Okay? So when you're looking at the display, this is a case of sexual general attention, you saw a dot, the dot is absolutely non-informative. Because half of the time, the target, that is the response queue, is going to be half of the time on the same side as the peripheral queue. And that would be a valid trial. But half of the time is going to point to the other location. And in advance, you know that. You know that the dot is uninformative. Right? So for all purposes, you could just ignore it. But you can't. What I'm going to show you actually is that you can't. So these are the results of one observer on the left and then of a group of observers. What I'm putting here is your contrast sensitivity. If the contrast sensitivity for the peripheral and the neutral conditions were the same, I would get a ratio of 1. If I take the ratio of the value to the neutral, everything above 1 shows a benefit, everything below 1 shows a cost. And this is if you have two different eccentricities. Uh, by the way, we're always eye tracking to make sure that observers are not moving their eyes. And uh, so we know exactly what eccentricity the display is presented. And you can see here, actually, that the amount of benefit is very comparable to the amount of the cost. So that means that when I am looking at Floris and I'm seeing net better, I may be losing here, Chris. And I'm, right? There's some trade-offs even in very, very simple cases. That is very consistent with the idea that there are limited resources. Um, in a series of studies, with a previous study, um, series of mine with some link, we have shown effects on endogenous attention and contrast sensitivity too. And here I want to show you an example that actually tells us how it is that the way in which we attend can interact with other processes that also help us manage energy, like adaptation. So we know for, from the studies that I told you about that attention increases signal intensity. And from studies that I don't have time to tell you, but this is very, very well established in the literature, we know that the intensity of the signal is going to increase and lengthen the adaptation effect. So I hope you all have seen those examples that are in the introductory books of psychology and perception textbooks where if you adapt to a particular pattern for some seconds, then the response to that pattern is going to increase and it's going to have an effect on how you see something later on. Yes, spatial frequency orientation adaptation um, are very common examples. So here the logic was very simple. We wanted to know if the attended signal, which is equivalent to an increased signal intensity, would lead to a stronger adaptation effect. So is attending to an adapter equivalent to having an adapter of higher contrast? Okay? So what we do is we're going to calculate the contrast thresholds of each observer. We have a sequence of um, displays, which is similar to what I've shown you before. Here we have some placeholders indicating to the observer where the four doubles are going to come. And what I ask you to do as an observer is to fixate in the center of the display. And when these four adapters appear, if you see this cube, that indicates to you that without moving your eyes, you should deploy your covert attention to this location and adapt and, and attend to this particular location. In other trials, the queue does not appear. It's just this fixation point, and it means that you should distribute your attention throughout. Okay? And after a variable interval, that can go from, uh, I'll leave that from 15 milliseconds to 16 seconds, which feels like, a, like an eternity. You never know in which trial you are. When this disappears, a target would appear, and in most of the trials, the queue that appears here is going to correspond to the location that you attended to. Okay? But not in all of the trials. And the question here is, what is going to be how are attention and adaptation going to interact? And of course, we're going to have an adaptation recovery period which is proportional to the adapting period. So that in the next trial, you don't have carryover effects. And here are the results. Again, I'm plotting the attentional effect given by the ratio of the neutral and the attended threshold as a function of adaptation time. So one would mean no effect. At the short times, you see a benefit as you would expect for each observer. The important thing here is what happens as you keep adapting. Everything that is a 
both the um, one line is enhancement and below is impairment. And as you can see, at about four seconds or so, now your performance is going to be worse, your contrast sensitivity is worse, after you attended a particular adapter. If we uh, summarize this, that means, and, and I put now your contract threshold, that means that in the valid cases, that is where the Q and the response to match, your threshold is lower for the valid than for the neutral, which in turn is lower than for the invalid condition. This is not surprise. This is a replication of many previous studies. The surprising part comes here. At six seconds, as you can see, this relation is exactly inverted. This is one of those two-way interactions that one likes to find in textbooks and a few times one finds it in um, one's experimental data. But here the results are very, very clear. What we see is that, first of all, attention increased contrast sensitivity, as we know. But the important thing here is that attention state modulated the effect of adaptation. So when we attended to a location, the enhanced signal strengthened the adaptation and therefore impair sensitivity over time. And at the same time, at the other locations where people did not deploy attention, there's going to be a diminished signal that is going to weaken the adaptation effect and therefore sensitivity is improved over time. Is that clear? Okay. Can I make more? Got you. Five minutes. <laughs> You're joking, right? Actually, you are. You go Now, go back to sleep. Okay, so let me talk about the neural correlates. Why can I ever work you Just ignore me. Okay, so let me tell you a quick story about it, how we go about showing this neural correlate of showing us attention and then I get to the first scene. Um, this is, I'm going to be able, thanks to David Heger that set me up with some of the fMRI explanation and other um, talks yesterday and today I don't have to spend a lot of time with this. I think That's this is your brain, brain David. Yeah. It's my brain. I stole it from your website. Okay. So, sometimes, when, see, when I was the chair I needed to check if you had a brain. So, I went around and checked everybody. Did they say symmetry? That's David. You see them a lot of slides. I know it really well. Very similar. Okay. The point of this is that it's been very well established that the responses increase in contrast. Here you have a very dim or that you can dim, dim plot that you can hardly see. It's a very high contrast. As you increase stimulus contrast, you're going to increase the ball response. And this is critical for the study that I'm going to tell you about. And yet, that, that's you, David. This is a slide that a postdoc of David led me some time ago. Jonas Larson also collaborated with some studies in my lab. And because he explained retinotopia, I don't have to do that now, which is very good. The only thing that I want to stress about this particular study, because it's about exogenous attention, is that we had to um, use a localizer scan and a localizer pattern to isolate the effect of the Q from the effect of the labor. And in order to do that, we presented the Q above the horizontal meridian so that it would be represented in the ventral areas and the labor would be represented in the dorsal areas. Um, this is fovea. Even though in B1 we, don't have, we have a continuous representation, you can see that there is no overlap. And we're going to take another precaution to make sure that the Q evoked activity is not going to contaminate the stimulus evoked activity. Okay? Uh, first, let me show you the performance of observers as they are in the scan. Uh, I would think it's much better to have exactly the same performance as you're scanning someone, so that's what we do. And these are the results on an orientation discrimination test that simply replicate previous findings. This simply shows that. Can I skip that slide? Okay. Um, this shows that a valid pre Q, you get higher accuracy than for an invalid pre Q, which I already explained. <coughs> and for post-use conditions. So as a control, now, we're going to have, instead of a cue telling you where the stimulus may be, although in this case it's uninformative, the cue is going to come afterwards. And because of the sloppiness of the hemodynamic response, we could not distinguish the response for by the stimulus and the cue. And we're going to take that limitation of the scanner as a 
an advantage, and we're going to say, if the response that we see in both activity is brought about by the physical presence of the cube, so we should see the same for the pre-Q and the post-Q condition. If the bone response is differential, then we can say that it's actually a tension that is responsible for that effect. And what I show here is the bone response for each region of interest from V1 from V3A. The fMRI response was estimated by a different evolution without assuming any canonical dynamic response function. And all the responses were similar in shape, and they picked about the third peak, which is about a um, second milliseconds. Here we have a marginal advantage of the pre Q condition. But here in V2, V3, and V3A, we have um, a significant effect of the pre Q condition, the valid pre Q condition, compared to all the other uh, conditions, including. One in gray that is very hard to see here, which is the presence of the stimulus where it was not attended to. So we always know what is the stimulus about activity, and therefore we can see that the differential effect goes above what is evoked by the stimulus, by the presence of the stimulus. And here we plot the attention modulation index, in which we, uh, we simply calculate a ratio of the difference between the peak of the valid PQ minus the baseline over their sum. And as you can see, and this has been found in many effects of attention, the effect of attention is going to increase gradually from striped to extra striped areas. Although um, I don't have time now, well, maybe um, the, the explanation may not necessarily be the same as with endogenous attention. So just to summarize this, I've shown you that an uniformative peripheral precute concurrently increases performance as well as the phenotopic specific stimulus evoked activity in early visual areas and that this increment is going to increase gradually from V1 to V3A. Now, the question that I think you heard about in this room is does attention intensify the sensory representation? And as you philosophers know and most of the psychologists know, this, debate, this uh, question has been a matter of debate for many, many years. Uh, we have very prominent people giving us different answers. Both Hamhoff, my teacher, said yes. Hecker said absolutely no. And then this is very interesting, and we may have time to discuss this or not. But this answer that says yes, but it does not ever lead us astray. Now, one other thing that they said, which is quite interesting, is that the subject is one which would repay exact experiment if methods could be devised or experimentation. I think. And so we devised a method in which we studied exactly this. Uh, this is a method that some of you have, are familiar with, but let me just guide you for a second. It's similar to the ones I said before, but the key here for us was how can we know what the perceived contrast is without telling us, without asking you explicitly to tell me what your subjective experience is. So we're getting to the subjective experience without saying, tell me how visible this is. Okay? How do we do this? We present two cues as before. Now we present two labors simultaneously. And we ask the observer to tell us the orientation of the higher contrast stimulus. Okay? And now with one key button, you're going to say in this particular case, you would press this key button because you know that this is tilted to the right and that is of higher stimulus. Now the trick is in different trials, we're going to have stimulus of different values. So there's going to be a standard stimulus which has one of these two values and a number of test stimuli that can be from going very dim to very, very uh, high contrast. Okay? So we ask observers to tell you the orientation discrimination as the primary thing they care about. In reality, we know what effects attention is going to have there. In reality, they care about how does it affect the perceived contrast? So that's why I assert to them that one of the stimulus has a higher contrast. Of course, in some cases, the stimuli are the same. And here we plot the percent of times that the observer says the perceived contrast of the test, of the one that is varying in contrast, is higher than the standard, as a function of the contrast of the test stimulus. So in black, you see the, neutral, the performance for the neutral condition, and not surprisingly, 50% of the times, people would say that two hours that are 6% contrast are the same. So if you 
sorry, I don't have that line here visible. We used to have it. This is exactly 6%. Now, when we queue the test pure, when that little dot, which is uninformative, appears above the test queue, now people attain the point of subjective equality as a lower contrast, and conversely, when the Q is above the standard Q, which as an observer you never know which one is which, now you need less contrast. Is that clear? Now, of course, the first question that comes to mind is maybe this is Q bias, maybe people see a dot and they're just more likely to respond that the dot is there. So here we take advantage of the fact that exogenous attention, as I told you, has a very short lived life. It peaks at about 100 milliseconds and it dies shortly thereafter. So if we have exactly the same experiment, but now the stimulus on set is incoming, that is the timing between the Q on set and the stimulus on set is 500 milliseconds, we repeat the stimulus and as you can see, the three functions collapse. Okay? A Q bias should show me the effects, exactly the same effects in both conditions, but it does not. And uh, this happens with uh, low contrast and with high contrast, and we've done, we've done all kinds of control to rule out alternative interpretations. Um, this is a way to summarize the findings. If you fixate on this dot and you were attending to the Gabor that is on the left, it will look to you as the Gabor that is on the right. Uh, recently, um, Hilliard's group um, adapted a procedure and did a cross-model attention study. So instead of having a visual cue, had an auditory cue. And what they have shown is that um, the the, that auditory cue also enhances perceived contrast. The interesting thing here is that in this EEG you can see, and I, sorry, I, the resolution here is much better than on the screen, but I hope you can see here that this P1 and this N1 have actually differential response when um, in the contralateral, when people are attending, when, when people say that a particular stimulus is of higher contrast. In the other cases, that differential response decreases. So that means that there's an early signature, and this is important because P1 and N1 which are about 100 milliseconds from 180 to 220 or so, reflect early sensory processes that can be modulated by attention. Longer components that happen, like P300, for example, is supposed to reflect post-perceptual processes. And this is an important story, but if it was, because if it was a decision-making story that we have here, we should not expect a differential response this early on. Now, I'll tell you now uh, just one other study. As I said, most of the time when we think about attention, we think about endogenous attention. So, in the previous study, I gave you a case of exogenous attention. When people leave the lab and we deceive them, when we, I mean deceive them, when we debrief them, and we say, you know, when the queue was there, Fred would be really happy, wouldn't he? When we said, you saw that queue, actually, this is what we're studying, what effect of the queue is, they, many times they tell you which queue. They came, they did the task, they left. We get exactly the same results if we run naive observers, intro side, you know, one on one, sign and come and go, or train psychophysical observers. Exactly the same. That's completely exogenous, right? Now the question is what about voluntary attention? Is it possible that exogenous attention alter perceived contrast, but voluntary attention, which presumably is much more at will? would give me a differential response. And I won't say the key for it. But that could have been, right? So we modify that paradigm in such a way that now there's a fixation point, and as you see, or you're not going to have to trust me, but the, this arm of the fixation point is going to change color. And that indicates to the observer that they should attend to a stream of letters that is going to appear in very rapid succession. Uh, succession. And 20% of the time, a letter, say X, is going to be possible. If you find that letter, you press the space bar. If you don't find the critical letter, now I'm going to ask you to do exactly the task you did before. You're going to tell me the orientation of the stimulus of the of that has higher context. Is that clear? This is simply a way to direct attention in a voluntary way to a particular location of space. 
and then we're going to piggy bank and we're going to see now once attention is here, what happens here. Is that clear? Yeah, but you have a lot of visual transients as well. That's yeah, I have exactly the same here and here, and then I have an interval of 100 milliseconds. Right, but you still have exogenous attention trigger for each of these transients. It's exogenous, it would be exactly the same component of all of them. Right, but it's Right? Yeah, but it would be exactly the same. So first let me show you what happens with accuracy, which I haven't mentioned before, by the way, but it's very important to know. As a sanity check, if I claim that I'm manipulating attention, I should be able to show you that I'm manipulating attention, I should show you that it affects performance, right? And we do that in all the exogenous attention. Here we show that where the cue, when we told you to attend, you were significantly better than in the neutral condition. And this is important because if we found no effect of attention on perceived contrast, I will have to show that I manipulated attention successfully, right? Now, the percent, okay, here I plot the results in the same way. A different control that we have done many times is to ask observers now to tell us the orientation of the stimulus of lower contrast. And that rules out other possible cues, or other possible biases too. If every time I'm more likely to respond to where they told me to attend, then I should get a differential response. I should get exactly the inverted spectrum. Effect, but I don't. And here we plot the contrast at which we attend the point of subjective equality. And as you can see, again, the test, I need less contrast when the test is pre I need more contrast when the standard is skewed. And the magnitude of the effect is indistinguishable whether I ask people to tell me about the higher or the lower contrast stimulus. But the last study that I'll take about is a very similar study but with color. So this is an interesting variable because people always ask, well, what would be the role of attention enhancement perceived contrast? And I claim that it has a functional role. It helps me see the world better. That's why I perform better on the world. So what would happen with color? We're going to do two studies in which we want to manipulate color. One of them has to do with saturation. So for these three hues, we're going to have different saturation values and we're going to play exactly the same game. Okay? In another experiment, I have three, I have this hue. This is going to be the standard, and now this is going to be more bluish, and this is going to be more purplish. And you're going to ask to tell me the orientation of the block that is either more purplish or more bluish, and again, we play exactly the same game. And this is what we find. When we manipulate color saturation, you get exactly the same effect as with perceived contrast. When we manipulate hue, zip. Okay? And that was very important for us, because we wanted to make sure that we didn't create this little monster paradigm in which people reply always in a given way. Okay? So this I consider to be a really interesting study, and if you want, of course, we can talk about why saturation and hue were expected to give us different final results. Do I have two minutes? Or is it over? Um, yes, but take two minutes. Okay. Um, so for some reason, that goes a little bit beyond my comprehension, but I have a group of cognitive psychologists that are very upset with me. I get some hate emails, <laughs> and I get things that say, how could you think that attention would make us be worse? Why would it alter our world? And they get very, very, very angry. And they have say, what about if? What about if? What about if? Again, I'm an experimentalist, so I answer to the experiments. Okay? So what about if the cube could interact? There's some cube polarity, and because you have a black cube, blah, blah, blah. So instead of discussing, I do the experiment. I do a black cube, I do a white cube. My results are identical. Next, could it be a Q bias due to low visibility because I'm a little bit not very sophisticated, so you send a stimulus, I take a capture, I put it on the screen, and I don't calibrate the display and I leave the lights on. And so if I replicate, um, the visibility of that stimulus is here, but the visibility of our stimulus is here. So this is the visibility of the stimuli for which I've shown you the effect. With very high visibility, people tell me 90% of the time correctly where the stimulus is with the lowest contrast I use, 100% with all of the other contrast, we get the same effects. What about, you know, I somehow, I don't know how, but maybe it's the Q. Maybe there's a Q bias, I don't know how. Okay, let's put a Q bias. Let's put a pre-Q or a post-Q. Pre-Q, post-Q. 
which we got for different dimensions. And I think I'll skip this unless someone wants me to talk about this. Uh, I guess maybe I can wrap it up here. I, I have some new data that I would be happy to show you where we show the effect of or the interaction of attention and adaptation on perceived speed. Um, but maybe I can leave that for later. So let me just conclude. Um, not only studies in my lab, but in many other labs have shown that attention alters appearance. There's a robust body of studies showing that it affects perceived contrast, spatial frequency and gap size, color saturation but not hue, motion coherence, flicker speed, and size of a moving object. Uh, I lost the screen here. Um, so what do we conclude from all these studies? Well, of course these studies, in my view, they support the linking hypothesis. The increased amount of firing good attention is interpreted as if the attended stimulus is of higher contrast. And you can um, put whatever dimension that I told you about there. Now, I submit that changes in performance and appearance are due to, atten due to attention are the behavioral consequence of the neural mechanisms in the line preferential processing. And the same computation can give us effects in performance and effects in perceived or in subjective experience, and these are people in the lab that have participated in a number of studies. These are contrast sensitivity. A lot of them have done such with contrast sensitivity with spatial frequency. Um, and um, I'll be happy to answer questions.